on a happier note, a bit of good news. On September 24th, uh, His Holiness, Pope Francis, uh, will visit us here at the United States Capitol. Uh, that day, uh, His Holiness will be the first Pope in our history to address a joint session of Congress. Uh, we're humbled that the Holy Father has accepted our invitation and certainly look forward to receiving his message on behalf of the American people. We meet here at a moment of testing for Europe and the United States and for the international order that we have worked for generations to build. But the end of these two wars affords us an opportunity. It allows us to refocus our intelligence and military assets and resources to other parts of the world where they are needed, where we face new challenges. This is the world you are graduating into. This is what I want to talk about today with you for a few minutes. I believe we, and particularly you, your class, has an incredible window of opportunity to lead in shaping a new world order for the 21st century in a way consistent with American interests and the common interest. Think of the possibilities. For the first time in history, the Western Hemisphere is in a position where it has the possibility of being middle class, democratic and secure from Canada to Chile. The Pacific Basin, peaceful and prosperous. A new relationship with China where we cooperate and compete, but where conflict is not inevitable. A revitalized global trading order, trading order defined by greater integration and economic growth, where barriers are lowered at the borders and behind our borders, generating millions of American jobs, where intellectual property is protected and the playing field is level, and where major powers come together to deal with the challenges of our time that require us all to act in concert. And there are many challenges. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Jogler 66, Hour of the Truth. Actually, it should have been Brett today who would do the intro, but he has other, um, uh, how do you say that, other obligements uh, where he has to be today. Obligations. Obligations. Right. Hello, hello. Oh, there he oh, is. there he is. <laughs> there he is, just surprise, when I'm surprise. announcing Surprise, surprise. Are you him. recording an intro? <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, you can oh. take over right away, do the intro, brother. And, uh, ah, I haven't started. even started my recorder yet. It's 31 below here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I started my recorder, and I'm glad to see you, brother, and uh, glad to see that you haven't been outside uh, frozen to the ground, but have come in and joined no, us to this broadcast. No, no, I was just on the phone, and uh, yeah, no, I, I, I haven't heard back from my working partner, so I don't know when he's going to call. I don't know. Um, if we're even going to work today, I'm kind of hoping we're not, but I'm just going to start in good faith that, uh, you know, I won't have to work and I won't get a call. So, yeah. So in the meantime, you can join us on the call. I just shared my screen. So you have that on. Beautiful. Okay. And then, and then you right. can do the intro. I mean, go along from here because I was just introducing you that you were not here, but now you are here. So please. All right. Wonderful. So, uh, We'll start from the top then. Yeah, we just or go on. The camera's running, so on. just go All on. All right. Yeah. Well, welcome everybody. Here we are. We are meeting today on the 31st of January, the last day of January 2019. I can hardly believe it that the month has passed already in 2019. And, Time is you know, up. as. Yeah, as we know, the Antichrist system, you know, they changed the to Gregorian calendar back in, what, uh, Martin 15, Luther's time? 1582. Or, or after Martin Luther, far after, or 40 years, or 30 years after Martin Luther. So, yeah, I mean, um, 
isn't that bizarre? He will think to change times and laws, and he does, and he uh, he continues to this day to do that. I mean, in modern day Europe, they have a different uh, um, week structure than we do here in the states. I mean, this is ridiculous. They changed uh, the Saturday to the the oh no Sunday to the seventh day of the week, didn't they? In the 1970s, yeah, with a... In the 70s. I with, mean, that's just nuts. That is with a law, a, a, a so-called DIN, that is a Deutsche Industrie norm, which means a German industrial norm. And um, this is a norm that has been spoken out then in Europe. And with that, they set the point that Monday is the first day of the week. By that, Sunday is the seventh day of the week. Now all the evangelicals can wonderfully hold their Sabbath on the seventh day of the week because that's Sunday. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So that's just one example of a modern day uh, change that we've seen in times and laws. And of course, what kind of laws do we have? We have all kinds of laws that man has made, but do they keep the commandments of God? Maybe partially, but not entirely. Too so, little. Mm-hmm, too little. But very good. And uh, we're going to be discussing Richard Bennett's paper today, I would imagine, right? Yeah, this is the second part of the broadcast that we started yesterday. That's and, right. Uh, we, wanted, we wanted to read one paper of Richard Bennett, but uh, when the latest newsletter he sent out, but when we were in the second sentence, there was a footnote to an even older paper of him, which is much more interesting to read to, for the beginning. And because it's a footnote of that, we are going to continue in that. And that is called The Heritage of the Reformation for the Present Time. This was broadcast number one then yesterday. This is broadcast number two. And we don't have only me here, but we also have, as you heard in the beginning, of course, Daryl Eberhardt with us, who is here on the phone right now to say hello. Hello, Daryl. Welcome to the broadcast today. And glad to be on with both of you, and uh, so glad to be talking about uh, Richard Bennett and his website, BereanBeacon.org. And again, we super highly recommend everybody go up to his website. And although we're going to be talking about a couple of articles of, of his, I uh, also want to mention that they've got an article up on Richard Bennett's website, BereanBeacon.org, right now. It's called The Biblical Uncovering of the Pope and the Papacy. It's a very long article. I would recommend that everybody go up and read that on their own time. It's called The Biblical Uncovering of the Pope and the Papacy. I'm not sure who at the Berean Beacon wrote it. It's the, There's no name at it. There's no footnotes, but it's a very, very good article. And we do promote Richard Bennett's website and his articles and his YouTube, his audios and videos, because Richard Bennett was a former Roman Catholic priest, a, f a former Dominican of 22 years. He has, a, as we mentioned earlier, he's got uh, earlier YouTubers, I call them. We mentioned that he has a great love for Roman Catholics. He presents the truth showing the differences between Roman Catholicism, its traditions, and then the, 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 what the Bible says. And that's very important. So again, we, we like to uh, promote Richard Bennett. Uh, he's 80 years old. We just really hope that you'll take advantage of the materials on his website. And we do want to emphasize Bible study and prayer, two of the most important things. Get yourself, if you're an English speaker, an Old King James Bible, and don't forget to pray. There's persecuted Christians around the world that are being murdered as we speak all around the world in different locations. So we have to remember we've got Christian brothers and sisters. Don't forget to pray for persecuted Christians. So again, so good to be on with both of you. Good to be alive. And, and we're having a heat spell here in southwest central Pennsylvania, we're only minus six degrees. That doesn't count the wind chill, but we, we're at minus six degrees right now, so we're feeling pretty warm. Yeah, wonderful, Daryl. Thank you very much for the introduction. I just have to add, when you were speaking about this paper of uh, Richard Bennett that you can get from his website, uh, you sent us an email yesterday about that, the biblical uncovering of the Pope and the papacy. I just put the picture in here because I uh, made a PDF on that. It is 18 pages, 
And uh, when we are done with the one that we are reading right now, speaking of the heritage of the Reformation of the present time, we can even go into that other paper. It's no trouble at all to do that. It's very much possible. So, when it's all right with you two guys, I would like to start the reading where we left off yesterday on page three. Is that okay with you? Please do. That's fine. Okay, so you have your paper there, so I can continue. You read on, and as I said yesterday, please, when there's something that you want to add to the broadcast, when you have a question, when you have a remark, when you have a comment, then please interrupt me at a, at a short moment of silence, whether when I'm reading or when I'm uh, commenting, no problem. I'm always looking forward to your uh, contributions to this, because this is not a one-man show, this is a three-man show, in the spirit of Jesus Christ, in the, in, with the help of the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus Amen. said, wherever two or three of you are gathered in together, in their midst I will be. And we ask for the presence of the Lord when we do these broadcasts, we, which are so important for the people today in the world, as Daryl pointed out, that there are so many lost souls, especially in the Roman Catholic world, we reach out for them with these broadcasts, and this is a reach out. Don't take it as an attack, but take it as that we tell you how it really is. The Roman Catholic Church puts blindfolds over your eyes, and we are ripping these blindfolds off, and we try to give you the light and the word of God as he put it out in the time of the Reformation when the Bible for the very first time was translated into the vernacular language. This is what this paper is all about. It speaks about the Reformation at that time. And let me add one other thing before I even go into reading this. I have never been a very big friend of the Reformation, especially the term Reformation, because the term Reformation in itself means that the Roman Catholic Church is reformable, but she is not. It is the synagogue of Satan. It is not reformable. It will never be reformed in this world. The Bible says so, but the head of that church and his whole kitty caboodle will be destroyed with the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is no reformation, but what there is and what there was in the time in the 16th, in the 16th century, that was a great awakening of the truth. And that was a protest, a protest that we have been forgotten today as we have forgotten to do many other things. We never forget to breathe, we never forget to eat and to drink, but we forget so many other things that are so vital for our spiritual life like we forgot to protest that the papacy and only the office of the papacy is the only biblical, historical and prophetic antichrist. And that protest that was formed in 1530 at the Reichstag at, and at Augsburg in Germany, when there were the Protestants and different counts and, 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 uh, counts and uh, other nobility went to the... Uh, to the Roman uh, Emperor at that time, Charles the Tenth and uh, Charles the Fifth, and they went there, and they protested, mm -hmm. and they said, "We will only listen to our conscience, and the basis of our conscience is the Bible, and the Bible alone, and no word of any man, and especially not of the man in Rome, the Pope." We will listen to our conscience. That was the moment the protest was formed. And that is something that I want to remember. Therefore, we should also call it the heritage of the Protestantism for the present time today. Because we have to reawake the spirit of protest. You guys over there in the United States of America were a country that was formed almost exclusively by people who fled the drag, the, 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 um, uh, the horrible... Uh, um, the horrible uh, in Inquisition over here in Europe. The people flew from all parts of the world. They flew from Germany, they flew from France, they flew from England, they flew from Ireland, they flew from even Italy, uh, uh, all over Europe. People were running away from the persecution of the Antichrist, forming a, a new life in this quote-unquote new world over there. The Puritans founded your country Really, not the government, but they founded your country. And they forbade Roman Catholicism. They forbade people who are Roman Catholic to come into any office. They forbade 
um, the um, celebrating of Easter, the celebrating of Christmas. They forbade the Roman Catholic Mass. They forbade the Eucharist. All that stuff. Nothing was allowed in the time of the um, uh, of, of the of the colonies in, in the in the 15th and 16th, especially the 16th and the beginning of the 17th uh, until the 18th century. All that stuff was forbidden. And that spirit of protest against the Pope, which, by the way, I'm really on a rant here today, I can't help it, but one of the very first official acts George Washington, your very first president of the United States of America, did was he abolished Pope's Day. That yep, was that's when, right. That was when Got in America it. the Pope was burned in effigy in remembrance of the 5th of November 1605 when the Jesuits started the gunpowder plot and wanted to... Uh, blow up the whole English parliament, including the king and his whole family, to install a Roman Catholic government again. And that Remembrance Day, the 5th of November, this, this, this burning of an effigy of the Pope was forbidden by George Washington, one of the very first acts that he did. Is that a Protestant act? No. But the spirit of Protestantism, the spirit that Martin Luther had, the spirit that all the starting reformers had Tyndale, Wycliffe, Latimer, Mortimer, Calvin, Zwingli, all the guys that even Richard Bennett counted in his paper that we read about yesterday, all these wonderful reformers, they all agreed in one point and one point only. The papacy was, is and always will be the only biblical, historical and prophetic antichrist. This is the spirit that set Germany free. And I'm doing so many videos in German and I'm calling for a rise up in Germany of the spirit of Protestantism of the 16th century. And I'm going to do the same right here. I'm going to call for a rise of the spirit of Protestantism in the United States of America to all the so-called Christians to please pick up their Bible and see who the Antichrist is and don't go into any churches and don't believe any priest or any pastor or any reverend or ever who tells you of a future Antichrist that comes at the end of the time and you don't have to care for it because you're being raptured out anyway. I'm sorry I had to get that off my chest before we do the Comment. podcast. Yeah, please. <clears throat> yes, Jörg. So on page 107 of the Divine Program of the World's History, the physical page of the book. I'm, I got the book in my hand. <clears throat> the title is The Puritans in the High Church. This is a very interesting read. I don't think we have the time to go over it right now, but well, anyone's just, got the time. Open that. Let me just open that here, and uh, yeah. we can go there. Do you know the page number of the P No, Just you, you type just in 107 and find it. It's probably going to be a couple more pages. You're um, talking of the, in the PDF. Yeah. Yeah, okay, okay, I got, I got it. 107. Okay, I got it yeah. here. Yeah, see there? Uh, the founders of the United States of America, 1602 AD. Is that what you're talking about? 1620, yep, that's right. 1620, yeah, okay. Go ahead and read if you want to. That's a long time before <laughs> 1776, isn't it now? Oh, how yeah. come? How come in our American history, we're never told about this? Because our our history textbooks, as both of you well know, have been heavily edited, sanitized, and to and they, this has been going on for a couple well, it's many decades and probably over a century and a half, where they have gone through our history textbooks, our encyclopedias, and because they have placed Roman Catholic priests and that on these different textbook selection committees, encyclopedia committees and everything, mm. they have removed everything negative to papal Rome. And what they did was they, as we mentioned uh, yesterday even, they sacrificed truth, truth in history, biblical truth, etc., all on what we would call... Uh, an altar of political and religious correctness. So, yes, gentlemen, our history textbooks, our encyclopedia has been heavily sanitized and edited, and the same thing happened in Great Britain. And that's why Albert Close's book is so important about the Jesuit plots, because he reveals the Jesuit machinations that were going on 
in England uh, even before and up to through the time of Queen Elizabeth and the many plots to assassinate her. So that's why we're speaking about these things, because working behind the scenes, the the Jesuit order have been trying to murder people like uh, Queen Elizabeth. Um, the Queen Elizabeth that, of course, was in England um, at the, uh, just a little bit after the time of King Henry VIII. Go ahead, gentlemen. I think that's an important point to make, is that uh, these Jesuits have been in the background trying to murder people, not just the gunpowder plot, but even plots before that, uh, to murder British royalty, including Queen Elizabeth. Wow. So I just got a, a, a phone call from um, my coworker, and I'm supposed to be there at 10. Okay. So I got no time. That no, that's sucks. okay. Do you want do you want to read a few sentences from this PDF now, or shall I just? Oh, continue? I'd love to read the whole thing, but uh, yeah, um, okay, yeah, then. I think I'll I'll just stick around. It's okay. It's okay. I I don't have to be there. It's it's not that big a deal. But no, go there, please, by all means. But <clears> no, but I just asked him if it was okay. I'd, I finished this session, and he said it's fine. So. I'm not going to worry about it. Okay, so the Puritans in the high church, the founders of the United States of America, 1620 A.D., the Mayflower sails from England with the founders of the Protestant United States of America on board. Hmm, interesting, huh? Not Catholics. <laughs> the high church party in the Church of England drove these Puritans from England. The Puritans were the original founders of the Reformed Church in England, at the Reformation. They fought hard to purify the national church from the degrading pagan rites, R-I-T-E-S, and ceremonies, which the so-called high church party persisted in uh, re uh, retaining. Yes. Finally, they broke away from the national church entirely and became the founders of the great nonconformist body. The Puritans, who after a warfare against arbitrary power in England, subverted the British monarchy and overturned the national church, laid in North America the foundation of the most mighty republic the world has ever known. At that time, perhaps? <laughs> well, now it's, uh, it's no longer a republic, is it? No, it's infiltrated by quote-unquote democracy, yeah. Yeah, that's right. We're a corporate entity now. It's been that way since, uh, boy, help me out, guys. Oh, um, the mid-1900s. Uh, the yeah. mid-1800s, sorry. 1800s, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, uh, the most mighty republic the world has ever known is gone since that time. That's the sad story that doesn't get told as far as I see it. Exiled from England during the reign of Bloody Mary, they returned on the ascension of Elizabeth, bent upon the great design of extirpating from the constitution of the Church of England what they deemed the last degrad excuse me, degrading vestiges of popery and remodeling it after the doctrines and practices of the Continental Reformers. Now commenced a stern and unrelenting struggle. The High Church Party, who was really Roman Catholic, uh, excuse me, the High Church Party, who were really Roman Catholics in doctrine and in many instances in disguise, resolved to admit no compromise. Isn't that interesting? They didn't compromise either, did they? The Puritans, on the other hand, exposed the utmost rage of persecution. Could only ex excuse me. Could only oppose it to an indomitable firmness and tenacity. The Puritan or low church ministers ejected from their livings, driven from their pulpits and their homes began to travel the country and disseminate their views by preaching and issuing pamphlets 
in defiance of fine and imprisonment. When James I came to the throne in 1603 AD, the Puritans lost no time in presenting to the king a petition signed by 825 ministers praying for the removal of superstitious Roman Catholic usages, which the high church party persisted in retaining, and other abuses, which still deformed the national church. The memorable Hampton Court Conference was the reply, a conference in which James I browbeat the unfortunate Puritan ministers in the con, uh, excuse me, in the coarsest manner, encouraged by the psychophantic smiles of the high church prelates and courtiers. Quote, if you aim at a Scottish presbytery, unquote, he, he said he, it agrees as well with monarchy as God with the devil. I will have none of that. I will have one doctrine and one discipline, unquote. Rising from his chair, he added, quote, I shall make them conform themselves or I will harry them out of the land or yet do worse, unquote. Denied the religious liberty they sought in England, many of the Puritans fled to Holland and from that country made their way to America. Their voyage in the Mayflower marked the commencement of the mighty development of civil, civil and religious freedom existing in North America today. After tossing on the Atlantic in their small and crowded vessel for more than two months, the pilgrims landed on Plymouth Rock on the 25th of December, 1620. Here, the low sand hills of Cape Cod, covered with scrubby woods that descended to the sea, seemed at first glance a perfect paradise of vendure to the poor sea beat wanderers. Before entering the harbor, they subscribed their names to a covenant as follows quote, Having undertaken for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith and honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in northern in in the northern part of Virginia, we do solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and no and of one other covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation, and by virtue hereof to enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and offices from time to time as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony unto which we promise all due submission and obedience, unquote. <clears throat> the hand of God is now seen in this covenant, guiding events to nobler issues than it than had been contemplated even by the best of them. American writers have denominated this, excuse me, this voluntary agreement, quote, the birth of popular constitutional liberty, and thought it was no intention of the pilgrims to cast off subjection to England. They did practically by giving every man the right of voting and choosing officers to draw up and carry out the laws of the colony, lay the foundation of, totally new, of a totally new system of government upon the basis of a democratic equality and practical independence over which the nominal sway of a distant power could never exert any efficient permanent control. A further settlement of Pur Puritan pilgrims in Massachusetts in the time of Charles I formed a latter stage in the planting of American colonization. Like the pilgrims of 1620, these had been driven forth from their native country by the intolerable burdens of enforced conformity. The Puritans fought the first battle with the high church Romanizing party 300 years ago. 
the Puritans in the Church of England and in the nonconformist bodies in this 20th century are fighting the same old battle over again with the High Church Romanizing Party. The High Church Party are responsible for the Kikuru, excuse me, <clears throat> Kikuyu, excuse me, Kikuyu. how do you pronounce it? Kikuyu yeah. controversy. Kikuyu controversy of 1914 AD, which is the same question the Puritans fought and died for 300 years ago. History repeats itself. And there's a little uh, footnote here. See history unveiling prophecy. Guinness. Is that Henry Gat Gratton Guinness? Henry Gratton Guinness's book, yeah. Wow. That's interesting. So, 1631, 20,000 Protestants massacred in Magdeburg, Magdeburg. Magdeburg. Magdeburg, Germany. 1641 AD, Romish conspiracy in Ireland, massacre of 40,000 Protestants. 23rd October, 1641, Romanist bishops enacted their people by every means in their Cited. power to massacre. Oh, incited, thank you incited their people by every means in their power to massacre the Protestants. 1647, the Westminster Assembly of 100 Divines declare in their confession of faith that the Pope is Antichrist. In the following words, quote, There is no other head of the Church but the Lord Jesus Christ, nor can the Pope of Rome in any sense be her head thereof, but is that Antichrist, that, that man of, of sin? Yeah. Ah, yes, of Antichrist. Hmm. That man of sin, that son of perdition, that exalteth himself in the church of God against Christ and all that is called God, unquote. This confession of faith ratified by English Parliament in 1649 A.D., this agrees exactly with the teaching of Luther, Knox, Calvin, Tyndale, Latimer, Ridley, and other great reformers. Yet, our 20th century theological professors and ministers as a whole now deny this application. Yeah, this book just blows my mind. Yeah, it's a very interesting read. That's why we started reading it. Yeah. But we are not that far yet. <laughs> no, we're not that far yet. But I'm saying, you know, we could we could just spend a lot of time on this. I mean, there is a lot of things going on here. Oh, we, we, we still will uh, spend some time with that book, Brett. Uh, that's the idea yes. that we read it. But it was, I think, in the spirit of what I said earlier about Reformation and Protestantism, it was very, um, uh, how do you say, the very fitting that you yes. brought this reading to our attention. Oh, and it's been on my mind, first and foremost on my mind, actually, and I was really surprised you brought that up, so I thought I better find that part. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, how the gentlemen, spirit works, can I, you know. Yes, please, Daryl. Can I make just one short comment? Please. And that is that uh, a very important point was brought up here. It, uh, the Roman Catholic Church horribly persecuted, yes, but uh, as has just been mentioned here, there was horrible persecution coming out of the Anglican version, which was heavily influenced by Romanists in England, and the persecution was horrible. Uh, the story of John Bunyan is just a, quite a story in itself, where this man who, who loved to preach the gospel spent about at least 15 years of his adult life being imprisoned because of British authorities uh, having him, uh, accusing him and uh, putting him in jail for preaching without a license, without being officially condoned by any official state church. And this uh, perse persecution that happened in England also happened in other places in Europe, and uh, both of you gentlemen are, I'm sure, are very aware of the horrible persecution of the Anabaptists. We've mentioned that before, the Mennonites and other groups that were horribly persecuted, not only by the Roman Catholic Church, but also by the Lutheran Church. 
and uh, other churches. So any organized religion uh, that gets uh, ascendancy or power in any state tends to be a persecuting church. And the, the Scottish Covenanters, that's a whole story in itself of the horrible persecution that they suffered at the hands of the British uh, soldiers and that uh, because of their having their open meetings and that where they were constant, they had well, they were attacked by ah. cavalry and that. So we wow. need to remember that that uh, state churches tend to persecute, and of course, ah, leading you... the pack is the it's... Roman Catholic Church. And we're not just picking on the Roman Catholic Church. It's the hierarchy. It's the sacerdotal system. Mm. It's a system of persecution that not only again hinders people from coming to their Heavenly Father through the Lord Jesus Christ in the way that the Lord Jesus Christ prescribes on the pages of Holy Scripture, but they hinder people from coming to their loving Heavenly Father and instead put other mediators like priests and Mary, the, the Roman Catholic ver- version of the, the, the Mary that the the humble Mary of the Bible they converted into the of course the Babylonian goddess, and uh, but this is a very important point that state churches tend to persecute and of course the uh, Anglican the the British Church uh, that came out of Romanism never came completely out and that's a good point that that uh, you both both of you gentlemen have made about these, uh, this persecution of others. And, of course, it spread to the colonies, even uh, Virginia. Patrick Henry was motivated to speak against. Uh, he saw a preacher who was preaching without a license that was whipped almost to the point of death. And that inspired Patrick Henry to be one of the, the most patriotic Americans who recognized that things weren't going exactly the way they should in the colony. So again, gentlemen, a very, very good points. Oh, yes, and we could say that's the high church party, correct? Yes, it, 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 it the spreads persecuting us with party. the Anglican Church in Virginia. Yep, in Virginia. Yeah. They called it, I think, the Episcopal Church in the U.S. Yeah, yeah I incredible. Yeah. I, for my part, find it very interesting and, and uh, very important to mention that the so-called Anglican Church is only a uh, Roman Catholic Church in disguise of Protestantism. Yeah. When you study history as you should do when you are busy with these things, <clears throat> you understand that in the time when Henry VIII was in rebellion with the Pope of Rome because he didn't want to annul his marriage he just all of a sudden made himself the head of the church and he made himself the head of the of the uh, at that time roman catholic church what which became the anglican church and of course that anglican church was quote unquote infiltrated by the english bible that was written by william tyndale who was um, put on the stake in uh, 1536 if i'm not mistaken in vilvorde and his latest words were, Oh God, open the King of England's eyes. And a year later, uh, King Henry VIII started to put out the English Bible and also in the churches. But the hierarchy of that church still was Roman Catholic. It yes. was not a new founded Protestant church. It was just a uh, former Roman Catholic church all of a sudden given a new head, namely King Henry VIII instead of the Pope. He declared himself to be the head of the church. He declared the English Bible now to be read in the church, whether the people li- like it or don't. And the problem is that that church never ever was from the roots Protestant. It always was from the roots Roman Catholic. And that's why it's still persecuted all these years. And things like, I'm, I'm sorry guys, but this Westminster mm-hmm. Confession, you know, these 39 mm-hmm. articles of them, I read them. They have so much Roman Catholic leaven in them, I can't even start. I yeah, that's right. I won't even start. That's right. Even though there were wonderful men working on this confession, like Latimer and Ridley, if I'm not mistaken with the names right now. Daryl has more 
biblical knowledge or more historical knowledge than me in that, this regard. But I think it was Latimer and Ridley who were also the writers of the Westminster Confession. But that Westminster Confession still hold, held at that time and still holds today very, very much Roman Catholic leaven. That's just something that you have to understand. So to really go out there and start a new from the grassroots movement, like Jesus Christ's movement was a grassroots movement. The power did not come from top, it came from the bottom up. He chose his 12 disciples. They were from the, That was a real grassroots movement that started that church. To really do that, you have to go to the Puritans. And the Puritans always have been hated and persecuted and killed in England, in America and everywhere else. And those are the ones who really upheld the true belief of Jesus Christ and the true Bible belief. Not the Anglican Church of England, by the way. I agree 100% with Jörg, and I want to mention, since he, he mentioned uh, Nicholas Ridley and Hugh Latimer, those were two men that were burned at the stake back to back, slowly burned to death at the stake because they truly believed, and they were correct, that the office of the papacy was the Antichrist. But both of those men cruelly burned to death, uh, and they are truly, indeed, some of the, uh, the greatest martyrs that you could read about. Yeah. I just wanted to, to mention that, because you yeah, mentioned the, both of their names. There's a, there's a quote here, um, For which, they are, for which they are very famous. And I just looked it up mm -hmm. and want to read that to you. Bishop Latimer and Ridley. It is said that the one said to the other when they were put to the, at the stake to die, back to back, as you just said, uh, Daryl, be of good comfort, Master Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day, by God's grace, light such a candle in England as I trust shall never be put out. Light a candle in England when being burned at the stake. That's what he spoke about. Can you imagine that? These two brothers in Christ have been towed down to this pole, been put in the fire, and then he reads this, he says this quote to, uh, this is Latimer, who speaks to Ridley and says, be of good comfort, Master Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day, by God's grace, light such a candle in England as I trust shall never be put out. The candle was their burning bodies. If you don't get in tears when thinking about this, I can't help you. And there are so many other such stories, and of course, uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs, and that has many. Now, if you ever get a folks ever get a copy of that to read, try to get one that's uh, unabridged, the full thing, because a lot has been removed. But the older copies of that book, it will make, as Yerk says, it will make you weep to read uh, that uh, these men and women, they burned many women at the stake and slowly children. also. And children up to the, they claim up to the age of 12, but they burned them younger than that. Yeah, 12 when for they girls and 14 different... for boys, wasn't it? Yeah, that was officially their, their, yeah. what their motto was, but uh, they didn't always keep to it. They sometimes burned people younger than that. And if they didn't So yeah, them... it's a horrible history, it's a horrible history, and... It's a history that we can't forget because, as, as we've mentioned before, uh, Spanish-born American um, philosopher George Santayana said that those who, who fail to learn the list, uh, lessons of history repeat the mistakes of history. And we are trying to warn people to be good watchmen on the walls. Ezekiel uh, chapter um, 33.6 says that we are to to uh, warn people when we see the sword coming. And we see a sword coming, we certainly do, and this persecution is, has gone on for centuries. The hatred is there within the, the walls of the Vatican to this very day. They have all the records on torture have been kept from the, from the Inquisition. 
Nothing has changed. They still believe that they have the right to use force and to murder people who will not bow the knee uh, to the, the, the papal sovereign. And that was the whole reason of the so-called counter-reformation uh, that led by the Jesuits was to get all of the power back into the office of the papacy that they had temporarily lost uh, during the time of Napoleon. And, of course, in 1929, we saw that uh, through the Lateran Treaty and that uh, papal Rome again became a civil power again. So it's not just a religious organization. It's also, a, as we've said before, a financial juggernaut, and it's a geopolitical, it's a diplomatic power. It's probably the, the greatest diplomatic power on earth right now, and through its control of secret societies, uh, such as the Knights of Malta and that, of course, the Jesuits are taking con complete control of the papal church because uh, at Trent, the Jesuits t basically took control, and they've been running it ever since. And uh, their whole, uh, whole reason for being is to get the whole world back under the popes like they were during the Dark Ages. And so that's one of our reasons for having these what I call YouTube sessions or youtubers is to to warn people that there's nothing changed uh, uh trent still exists uh, the council of trent and all of its horrible anathemas and uh, excommunications etc they all still exist and all of the books on how to torture people and that still exists and the torture goes on to this very day in various places of the world yeah can I just interrupt you here a little bit, Daryl? Sure. Uh, you were just saying to our listeners, um, at the Council of Trent, the Jesuits completely took over the Roman Catholic Church. I guess that there are some people who do not do their own research, who tip themselves on the top of the head and say, no, Daryl's gone crazy. How do you prove that? How are you sure of that? Well, I can tell you that when you go into the annals of the Roman Catholic Church, you will learn that in the year 1543, that is, three years after the founding of the Jesuit order, Pope Paul III issued a papal bull that was called Injunctum Nobis. I think I still have a picture here. I'm just uh, looking it up, if I have a picture here. And with that papal bull, Injunctum Nobis, he gave the... Uh, yeah, this one here. He gave the uh, general of the Society of Jesus unlimited power. Many people do not even know this. And you know, this is written in the book that I read in German of Karl Theodor Griesinger, which is putting down a history of the Jesuit order from the beginning of their order until the time the book is written in 1866. And I have a little quote here. As you can see in the picture, I'm going to read this quote to you. It is taken right from this papal bull. The general of the order, as soon as he is nominated, shall have complete power as to the government of the society, the Society of Jesus, and especially also over the whole members of the same, wheresoever these latter may reside, and with whatsoever office or dignity they may be endowed. His power shall indeed be so unlimited, that should he deem it necessary for the honor of God, he shall even be able to send back or in other directions, those who have come direct from the popes. Did you hear that well, my dear brothers? Yes. So when Daryl says the Jesuits completely took over the control of the Roman Catholic Church and the Council of Trent that started in 1545, he speaks with the authority of the pen of the Pope who penned down the papal bull in Junctum Nobis in 1543. No conspiracy theory here. It's everything documented. And you can look that up for yourself. Please, Daryl, you want 100% to do something. 100% correct, and history proves it. When you look at uh, all of the doctrines and that that have come through, uh, papal infallibility, etc., 
uh, the Jesuit, you see the Jesuit fingerprints and you see the Jesuit footprints all around it, just as we mentioned concerning the fomenting of wars and revolutions. And you take your pick, the American Civil War, so-called, uh, of 1861 to 1865, the fomenting of World War I, as we saw in J.A. Kensett's book, the fomenting of World War II and World War I, both written by French author Edmund Paris in his book, The Secret History of the Jesuits. These guys are infamous for just going around and starting wars and revolutions left and right, not caring how many hundreds of thousands and millions of people get caught up and slaughtered and murdered in these. And again, that's one of the reasons that uh, we're on and talking about these subjects is the, these people are mass murderers. I call them mass murder, mass murder incorporated, and it's a sad uh, epithet for them, but that's what they are. They love to kill people. So, gentlemen, go ahead. Okay, Brett, do you have something to say, or shall I just continue in the reading then for them for a moment? Uh, yeah, I got to get out the door. Okay. And go to work. I, I kind of dread having to do this, but... Um, oh, it's all right. When you have other obligations, we understand completely. <clears throat> yeah, I knew it would happen. Um, I mean, in the sense that, you know, work is inevitable. I have to constantly, even when it's 30 below. <laughs> and you guys wonder why I drive an eight-cylinder truck. Well, there you go. <laughs> Yeah. No, no problem. You you attend to your work, Brett. I will send you the video later, and I'm gonna continue Beautiful. a little bit. Beautiful. I, uh, I wish you all the best in the in the continuance of this. I just wish I had more time to spend. I just really ought to get going, though. So. And no thank problem. you, Brett, for your contributions. Thank you so much. Yeah. You're welcome. I'll just reading, leave yeah. the computer on with the recorder going, and uh, it'll just shut off when you guys hang up the call, if you don't mind. Okay. No. No, we don't mind. Good. So I'll just back up. I'll just be another backup recording. But I really hope that uh, the session finishes well. It really went well. And, and thanks for having me on. And, and of course, uh, I'll be putting this up on my channel soon, I think. Okay. Okay. Have, have a nice day then. And uh, see you, you probably tomorrow. And yep, take care. Stay warm out there. <laughs> yeah, you too. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> bye-bye. So, okay, Daryl, uh, we two are still left as we uh, started up in the beginning. It was very nice of uh, Brett that he took the time to come here and visit us. But now I'm going to uh, gonna uh, keep on reading in this paper, The Heritage of the Reformation for the Present Time, which I uh, abruptly stopped reading because I couldn't just cope with the word Reformation. I wanted to tell the people that it is not about Reformation, but that it is all about protest. And as you so often say, Daryl, it's about being watchmen on the wall, as the Bible reminds us to do, right? Yes, sir. So I'm going to continue reading in, uh, on page three on the heritage of the Reformation for the present time. They all believed, speaking of the different reformers that we mentioned during this broadcast, that works, fasting, money or penance does not obtain salvation but that salvation is God's free gift. And I commented on that part yesterday in the first uh, edition of this video series already, so I don't go into any comment in this reminding of this paragraph. This doctrine formed the cornerstone of the Reformation. Agreement also existed on the supreme and sufficient authority of the Scriptures, communion in both kinds, you know, that was what Jan Hus was persecuted for, because he gave the bread and the wine, and the disavowal of saint worship, images, relics, purgatory, mass, celibacy, and the Pope as the head of the Church. And I add, and the Pope as the Antichrist. The Reformation proper, the break with Roman Catholic authority, was accomplished in a relatively short time. The Reformation was a constant, all-encompassing moving of the Holy Spirit. It was truly a glorious spiritual awakening when multitudes were freed from the bondage to the superstition and ritualism of an apostate papacy and converted by the gospel of grace. 
The rediscovery of the sole authority of Scripture led to obedience to God and His Word, just as the rediscovery of the doctrine of justification by grace through faith alone led every true believer into direct and personal contact with the God of revival. The heritage of the Reformation left us prayer. What then is the heritage of the Reformation? What can we learn from it for our time, even today, 2019? The Reformation itself was a revival grounded not only in the Word of God, but also in prayer, as each previous and each subsequent revival has been. As Charles Haddon Spurgeon so graphically described in the prayer that was the buttress from which arose the Reformation, Spurgeon said, quote, There were hundreds who signed and cried in secret, O oh God, how long? In the cottages of the Black Forest, in the homes of Germany, in the hills of Switzerland, in the palaces of Spain, in the dungeons of the Inquisition, and the green lanes of England. Unquote. Thus prayer was the underpinning of this great movement there as the dedicated prayers of numberless hearts across Europe pleaded the Lord to send a mighty moving of his spirit. Ian Murray in his book on revival and revivalism quotes Jesse Lee as he described the year 1787. Quote, there was a remarkable revival of religion in the town of Petersburg, and many of the inhabitants were savingly converted, and the Christians greatly revived. That town never witnessed before or since such wonderful displays of the presence and love of God in salvation of immortal souls. Prayer meetings were frequently held both in the town and in the country, and souls were frequently converted at those meetings, even when there was no preacher present. For the prayer and exhortation of the members we were greatly owned of the Lord. Now this refers to a footnote, number six, where this is taken. This book is full of very well done documentation. And here we read that this is taken from the work from Ian Murray, Revival and Revivalism. I just have to make one little comment on this, and I think that Daryl will agree with me, because Daryl is a Bible-believing Christian, as I am. And then we also we spot, of course, this little mistake they put in this little text here, that, um, that uh, uh, who was it? Ian Murray put in there, because he speaks of salvation of immortal souls. I'm sorry, but the immortal soul is a Roman Catholic Babylonian-based heretic teaching. The Roman Catholic teaches that the souls are immortal. Nowhere in the Bible do you find any teaching of an immortal soul. The Bible clearly says, when we go into Genesis, the book of creation, the very first two chapters, when man was created on the sixth day, and God breathed life into the nostrils of man, and man became a living soul. Not he received a living soul, he became a living soul. The Bible is very clear that when man dies, he lies in the grave, sleeping, awaiting the resurrection, whether the one to join Jesus in the air when he comes back the second time, or the resurrection of the damned for the judgment. But the dead bodies lie in the ground, not breathing. So when they are not breathing, they have no soul, because the soul is the breath of life. And when you are dead and you don't breathe, the breath of life is taken from you. That is a mistake that many, many people, especially even quote-unquote Christians, do. They believe in the immortality of the soul. But if the soul was immortal and goes to heaven right after death, why would there be any need for a resurrection? Why would there be any need for a Messiah to come to relieve that soul? No. You have to be very, very careful when reading these things. Not everything, even written in these papers, is completely biblical. And when this Murray guy here writes about, Ian Murray writes about 
that there were wonderful displays of the presence and love of God and salvation of immortal souls, just scrap the word, the word immortal. It is not fitting in there. It is a heretic word. Daryl, do you have a comment on that, what I just said? No, I agree with you. Thank you. I knew you would, because you are as true a Bible believer as I am, and we have to purge out every leaven of Roman Catholicism in any kind of teaching of man, even in this paper, even though it comes from Richard Bennett. This quote that was made by Ian Murray in his book on revival and rivalism is not biblical. Anyway, he continues to say, Ian Murray also described the Great Revival in 1776, which spread extensively through the south part of Virginia. He remarked that work was not confined to meetings for preaching. Murray writes, quote, At prayer meetings the work prospered and many souls were born again. It was common to hear of souls being brought to God while at work in their work while at work in their work in their houses or in their fields. It was often the case that the people in their cornfields, were white people or black, and sometimes both together, would begin to sing, and being affected would begin to pray, and others would join with them, and they would continue their cries till some of them would find peace to their souls. Unquote. Murray demonstrated that the great heritage of the post-Reformation revivals was prayer as the underpinning of every single awakening. The first great awakening after the Reformation occurred in the 18th century. Jonathan Edwards in America and George Whitefield in England were two prominent figures. Prior to the outpouring of the Lord's grace, we find prayer in the lives of these men and their associates. Also, in 1859, prayer was the prelude to revival in Ulster, Northern Ireland, and in Wales at the end of the 19th century. Thus, we have the account of Peggy and Christine Smith as they prayed for the promise of revival on the Isles of Lewis in Scotland in 1949. They lived in a small cottage by the roadside in the village of Barvis. They were 84 and 82 years old. Peggy was blind and her sister almost bent double with arthritis. Unable to attend public worship, their humble cottage became a sanctuary where they met with God. What followed was that from 1949 through 1952, a widespread revival swept throughout the Isle of Lewis. Instrumental in this awakening was the evangelist Duncan Campbell. Behind the scenes, however, it was later known that the revival was a result of the faithful prayers of Peggy and Christine Smith. Now we must ask the question, where are today's equivalents of Peggy and Christine Smith? Are we willing, in the quiet of our own homes and in small groups together in our churches, to do business with the God of revival? Then let us seek for God's enabling to pray and go on praying as he has always used prayer to pave the way for his revival. Let us make the psalmist's prayer our own, where it states, I am afflicted very much, quicken me, O Lord, according to thy word. And this is taken from the book of Psalms, chapter 119, verse 149. Hear my voice according to thy loving kindness, O Lord. Quicken me according to thy judgment. Now, this is taken from Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. Then may the Lord God, in his sovereign grace, give revival mercy on us in our times. May our prayers for revival plead the promises of God, guide our desires by such promises, and ground our hopes on the faithfulness of our loving Heavenly Father to hear us. And this is where I'm going to eat, end the reading for today. We are going into the next subject, the ne uh, sub chapter next time. I also think of another very important quote from the Bible where it says, The prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Mm -hmm. And that is something that we should do every day. And um, 
I am not a fan of public prayer, so you will probably never hear me doing any prayer on a video like this. Probably not even with Daryl together or with Brett or even with Tom Fress. I pray on my own. I pray when I am alone and I, then I speak to my Heavenly Father through His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, who died for me 2,000 years ago and shed His blood for my sins. And I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and I uphold that personal relationship by daily speaking to him. I speak to him as yeah. a brother. I speak to him as a friend. I speak to him as if we were sitting next to me, as he is always there and protecting me. And that is the most wonderful thing I can do. I just don't go into prayer. No, I'm just thinking of him and talking to him when he's, quote unquote, sitting next to me. Jesus is always with me. I don't need special time set away for prayer. My mind is set on my Lord 24-7, 365 a year, I can tell you that. My mind is not spinning around anything else but the Lord. And that's the way it should be. And please, Daryl, I want to leave to you the comment for the closing of this section today. I agree with your prayer is so important. Prayer is mentioned so much in the Bible. The Psalms are full of prayers, including imprecatory prayers, and uh, many of uh, the prayers that I have taken that I pray, uh, I try each morning to, uh, first thing, to get in prayer with the Lord and to pray for others, my Christian brothers and sisters, because many of them, as I already mentioned, are being persecuted. They're being murdered in places in Africa, in the Middle East, in Asia. Many Christians are being persecuted and tortured and murdered uh, as we speak. And so this is not something that's just in the, the deep, deep past. It continues to this very day. So prayer is so important. I would encourage uh, all of the uh, listeners and viewers of this YouTuber to, to get in their Bibles, study their Bibles, and to make sure that uh, they're praying every day to the Lord seeking his guidance, because we, we sure need his guidance. Uh, uh, around the world, many Christians, many of us Christians, have confusion of faith, to use a, a term I believe that's used in uh, Jeremiah, but uh, a lot of uh, great prayers can be found in the Old Testament, and uh, I think especially of the Psalms, I've taken a number of my prayers uh, uh, that I pray to the Lord um, out of the Psalms, and I think of uh, I think it's Psalm 40 and Psalm 35, but there is just so many good prayers, um, and the Lord uh, expects us to pray to Him, keep that personal relationship open, and we need to confess our sins, keep that up to date. But again, we need to be praying for one another. So I encourage all of us to be daily in our Bibles, studying God's Word, and to be daily in prayer not only for ourselves for discernment, etc., but be praying for others for pray and praying for our brothers and sisters in Christ. So thanks so much, Yerk, for um, being on with Brett and me, and uh, um, so glad that we got uh, some very important information out. And God bless you, and uh, thank you so much for your contribution. A new partnership of nations has begun. And we stand today at a unique and extraordinary moment. The crisis in the Persian Gulf, as grave as it is, also offers a rare opportunity to move toward an historic period of cooperation. Out of these troubled times, our fifth objective, a new world order can emerge, a new era, freer from the threat of terror, stronger in the pursuit of justice, and more secure in the quest for peace. Certain that we stand at a defining hour. Halfway around the world, we are engaged in a great struggle in the skies, on the seas, and sands. We know why we're there. 
We are Americans, part of something larger than ourselves. For two centuries, we've done the hard work of freedom, and tonight, we lead the world in facing down a threat to decency and humanity. What is at stake is more than one small country. It is a big idea, a new world order, where diverse nations are drawn together in common cause to achieve the universal aspirations of mankind, peace and security, freedom, and the rule of law. Such is a world worthy of our struggle and worthy of our children's future. If it is possible, I want to continue to build a lasting basis for U.S.-Soviet cooperation for a more peaceful future for all mankind. The triumph of democratic ideas in Eastern Europe and Latin America and the continuing struggle for freedom elsewhere all around the world all confirm the wisdom of our nation's founders. Tonight, we work to achieve another victory, a victory over tyranny and savage aggression. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. I could see from afar, looking up Wilhelmstrasse towards Unter den Linden, how there was hundred thousand of people when they passed Hitler. They just became completely delirious. They began to shout these cries, I will never get out of my ears. Heil, Sieg, Heil, they demented. And here I got confirmation how those irrational forces, uncontrollable forces, in Germany, in the Germans, had erupted, had broken out, were running riot, were departing, marching, marching on 